So let's begin with a word of prayer. So, Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this morning. Uh, we thank you for your grace each and every day, Lord. I just pray that you would just uh, guide our thoughts in this class, Lord. Help us to, uh, again, add to our understanding. And I just thank you for these students this day, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Okay, so uh, I want to talk a little bit more about nth roots of unity. So... <clears throat> And rather than trying to talk about it in the abstract, what I'm going to do is just give you a somewhat concrete example here. Um, so, how about the sixth, the sixth roots of one? So, this um, works out to, well, in principle, it's, um, what is it? It's, it's z uh, in the complex numbers such that what? z to the sixth power is equal to 1, right? That's the definition of, the, of this, right? Now, what this works out to as it happens is omega, omega squared, omega cubed, omega to the fourth, omega to the fifth, and then omega to the sixth turns out to be 1, where omega is equal to um, you know, the exponential of um, 2 pi i over 6. Okay. I mean, we, we could have derived this by just straight away solving this equation using the polar form and the degeneracy of the imaginary exponential. Okay, but um, that said, this is what? This is e to the pi i over 3, right? And so... Let's see here. That actually is what? That's cosine of pi over 3 plus i times the sine of pi over 3. And so, of course, I can express that in its Cartesian form a little bit more explicitly. This is actually omega is equal to what? It's equal to 1 plus i times the square root of 3 all divided by 2. Now, geometrically, this is very beautiful. Because what's going on here, if you want to picture it, is as follows. So let me draw the unit circle in the complex plane. All right. So there's a real axis, imaginary ax axis, it's the z-plane. And what we have here, we can, we can plot it. Uh, we can illustrate this. Omega is 60 degrees up off the real axis. It's something like there. Well, maybe, maybe there, I don't know. And then, omega squared, remember what happens when we multiply by a complex number. We multiply the moduli, and we um, add the standard angles, right? So if you square a number, you square the standard angle. And if the modulus is 1, it stays on the unit circle. So omega squared is actually just over here, right? And omega cubed, 60 degrees more. So I'm going 60 degrees. Um, up to the limits of my artistry, of course. And so there's omega cubed, which is minus 1. Omega squared, so if, if omega is 1 plus i root 3 over 2, omega squared is, by the symmetry here, you can, without even doing much anything else, it's minus 1 plus i squared of 3 over 2, right? Um, down here, you've got omega to the fourth, which is minus 1 minus i squared of 3 over 2. And omega to the fifth over here, um, would be 1 minus i squared of 3 over 2. And there's one more. What's the sixth root of? One. Yeah, 1. <laughs> That's always there. So 1 is equal to omega to the sixth. Now, there's, you know, really beautiful thing that happens here, of course, which is that omega to the k power is equal to omega to the k plus um, any multiple, right? Any multiple of 6. So this is, this is also equal to omega to the ninth, right? This is omega to the ninth. This is omega to the 15th, right? This is omega to the 6th, omega to the 12th, omega to the 18th. 
so forth and so on. So the structure here, really, if you start thinking about it, it's, it's that of modular arithmetic, right? So there, there's a bijection here between the additive uh, group of modular arithmetic and the multiplicative group here. Um, but anyway, let me see what I want to say. There's something else that's really, really um, nice about this. What, what can you say about the structure of these, these, these roots of unity? What, what can you say? Is there any particular pattern here? I mean, first of all, there's a rotational symmetry, right? If you rotate it by 60 degrees, you get back where you started. There's no change in the pattern here as we look at it, if I had drawn it pr precisely anyway. Yeah, they're all in the unit circle. I agree. Uh, oh, the distance between these is, yeah, that's, that's, I think that's another aspect of the rotational symmetry, right? If it, if it wasn't the case, it wouldn't be rotationally symmetric. But there's something else about the pattern as they're, as they're, as they're situated above and below the real axis, right? You notice every, every nth root of unity has a, has a conjugate pair. So the conjugate of omega 2 is omega to the fourth. The conjugate of omega is omega to the fifth. And omega to the sixth and omega cubed, these are self-conjugate. They're real, right? And this will always be the case. If you study the nth roots of unity, they always come in either, they're either real or they come in a conjugate pair. This actually is, and that, you know, this thinking about roots in terms of their symmetry, that, that, um, that idea actually is very, very profitable. Here's what Galois said about it when he was 21, right before he, he died. <laughs> he said, go to the roots of these calculations. Group the operations, classify them according to their complexities rather than their appearances. This, I believe, is the mission of future mathematicians. This is the road on which I am embarking in this work. But roughly speaking, you know, noticing these kinds of patterns between the roots ultimately leads to a systematic way of studying how you solve polynomials, and ultimately leads to things like what's known as Galois theory now, um, which answers questions like, you know, which which polynomials can you factor, um, it, it, you know. Um, so the abstract theory of how to factor polynomials, Galois theory, roughly speaking. And it's, it's all about these, these symmetries between the roots. There's something called a Galois group, which looks at that. Okay, so uh, a little bit more lowbrow application here, though. If we think of f of z is equal to z to the sixth minus one, right? I know six zeros. I know six zeros of this polynomial the sixth roots of unity are all zeros, right? Because, and so remember there's a factor theorem. If f of z naught is equal to zero, that implies that f of z is equal to z minus z naught times g of z. That's still true for complex polynomials for pretty much the same reasons it was true before that you never proved. Um, <laughs> so what's that mean? Well, that means I can factor f of z using what I just did, basically as z minus omega, z minus omega squared, z minus omega cubed, z minus omega to the fourth, z minus omega to the fifth, and z minus one. That's no accident, right? One of the things that makes the complex numbers so special is that, right, first of all, as we discovered the other day, every single non-zero number has a multiplicative inverse, right? has the usual laws of addition, multiplication, all the good stuff. So it's a field, right? Every non-zero element has a multiplicative inverse. But in addition, every polynomial we can factor completely into a product of linear factors, possibly re repeated. That means that the complex numbers forms what's called an algebraically closed field. Here's an aspect of that. We can factor the sixth order polynomial into six linear factors. Of course, um, this is not just any old polynomial. This is a polynomial with real coefficients. So we also know the story, how, it, how, this, how the story goes with the real polynomials, right? We know that a real polynomial will factor what? It will factor into um, linear factors, possibly with some irreducible quadratics, right? And so the irreducible quadratics are coming from these conjugate pairs when you multiply them back out, right? So anyway, long story short, to solve thing, you know, something like z to the n equals to stuff, what do we do? We basically say, okay, well, we can take the nth root of both sides. Basically, z is equal to 
stuff to the 1 over n power, but this is a set of things. So when you're solving problems, you have to, you have to take that into account. So hey, let's go back to basics for a second here. I think it's a useful exercise. Um, let's look at z squared plus bz plus c equals to 0. Let's see if we can solve that using these nth roots that we've so discovered. I mean, this is kind of a, it's a problem some of you want to teach to high schoolers, I think, maybe. Are there any future teachers in here? There's one. Not you, Malia. Yeah. You haven't decided? Oh, OK. Sometimes I'm not sure if I've decided either. But <laughs> I had a friend who taught business calculus in grad school, and he was like, no, I'm not doing this with my life. I'm out. <laughs> that class like convinced him he didn't want to be a teacher. <laughs> oh, anyway, OK, so how do you solve this? Basically, um, we do this thing called completing the square, right? So z plus b over 2 squared. Um, so I have, if I do that, I have to subtract b squared over 4, right? And then I can isolate the square. I just I decided not to bother with putting a in here because it's easier to, you know, there's less talking if I look at the monic case. Monic means that the leading coefficient's one. Okay, so we've got something squared is equal to stuff. So what we can do is we take we'll look at all the basically this means that z plus b over two is equal to what? Well I'd say equals to, but I should really say it's an element of b squared minus four c over four the 1 half. The 1 half, the 1 half work, this is a complex 1 half. I mean, I can take the, 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 the square roots of 3 plus i. Or minus three, certainly. And so there you go. That's the uh, the general solution. Looks like this: z is equal to, um, you know, well, z. Let's say z is an element of minus d over two plus b squared minus four c over four to the one half. Now there are two things in there. Now I probably can play with it and make it prettier, but. I'm not going to do it in the general complex case, because that seems more like fun for a test. Um, for, for us in here, sorry, it's too soon. Um, let's suppose that b and c are real. I didn't say that yet, did I? But now I'm saying b and c are real. If b and c are real, right? you can write b squared minus 4c over 4. is equal to the modulus of b squared minus 4c over 4, right? Well, I mean, there's really two cases here. If it's real, it's either positive or negative, this quantity, right? So either I have e to the what? e to the 0. Right, just e to the 0 times i. Or I have the same thing, e to the, e to the pi i, right? Because if, if you, you know, you're either here or you're here with this, this b squared minus 4c over 4, right? So either the argument is 0 or the argument's pi. So if I calculate the half, the but how do you, you know, um, if I if I have, let's just suppose I have zeta, and I want to calculate the one half root of it, what's that look like? It looks like you take the uh, the square root of the modulus, uh, and here I just mean real square root, okay? So just the ordinary square root of the modulus, and then you have you know, 
e to the i theta naught over 2, and then the square root of the modulus of eta, e to the i theta naught over 2. But let's see here. Um, and we, we basically, you have to multiply by the nth roots of unity. Right? One of the, what, are the, what are the roots of unity for 1? I mean, what, what is 1 to the 1 half? What is that? What squares to 1? Exactly. So, you know, the example we did last time, we had some, com like, you know, we had, there was, like, we look at the fifth root or something, I fourth root, I think it was. Yeah, the fourth root, so we had to multiply by i each time to get the next solution. Here, there's this, which is the principal root, and then there's this, which we, we just put a minus. So, the bottom line is, whether it's this or this, when you look at the, 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 you know, the other solutions in the one-half power, you just end up, whichever one of these is, you multiply by minus one. So these two cases then collapse back down to one case. You just have plus or minus. So basically, um, long story short, when you think through it, um, b squared minus 4c over 4 to the one-half is just... Um, the absolute value of b squared minus 4c over 4 square rooted comma minus that. Oh, I don't think I'm saying it quite right. Yeah, there's definitely something I'm doing wrong. No, 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 this is, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I have, I'm, I'm askew. Ah, no, this is not right, I'm sorry. It takes me a while to fix this. Let me just make it a quiz problem. <laughs> Tell you what, what I'll do is I'll clean this up and um, post it for you guys this, this weekend, okay? The, I, I, I should be picking up on the I. I, I what I, I forgot about is that this, you, you do the angle divided by 2, so if this is pi, I get a pi over 2. And that's where you pick up like the i. There's possibly an i in the solution times a real number, right? We, we know if you solve a quadratic polynomial, you either get plus or minus a real number, or you get a conjugate pair, right? So we should be picking up on that. But what, what, I'm, what I was trying to tell you here, and I have, I have managed to um, choose a notation which makes it impossible for me not to spend all of class on um, through my poor planning. I wish I did plan for today, but. Um, Bottom line is that formula we write, just putting plus and minus, it turns out to be true. But it's true if you actually go through this more general technique that I'm showing you. It produces the usual quadratic formula. We just kind of get lucky when we put plus or minus there on the base of, basis of intuition. So, but anyway. <laughs> I have put this on tests before. And then I have people just quote the quadratic formula for me. And I'm like, that is so not the point of that question. <laughs> but anyway. Well, I think I have wasted an inordinate amount of time of class on that. I'm sorry about that. All right. By the way, the fundamental theorem of algebra is something that we will prove this semester. It's one of the wonderful things about uh, this course is we will find pretty elementary, in terms of this course, proofs of the fundamental theorem of algebra. And I think that's, that's a really nice thing. Oh yeah, there are probably dozens of distinct proofs of the fundamental theorem of algebra. Almost every kind of new construct we come up with in here, it provides some kind of new proof. <laughs> okay, so we still got a lot of notation we're kind of setting right now. Eventually that settles down, so enjoy it while it lasts. Um, so at this point, I'm going to talk to you about the concept of local inverses and uh, branch cuts. Hand in hand with that, we need to talk about restrictions of functions. But before we even do that, I just I need some I need some notation, all right? So here's the definition that we'll use. 
And here, if I have, say, z to w, like that, what that is is the line segment from z to w. So if you like, I could write it like this. OK, so this is, this is z plus t times w minus z, such that um, 0 is less than or equal to t is less than or equal to 1. That's just a fancy way of me telling you that that is like this line segment. OK, that's a line segment. Now, or uh, we also allow z and w to equal plus or minus infinity. Um, so and those usually just correspond to the real axis, plus or minus infinity. But that, that's essentially saying that you've got a ray that goes to the left or the right. Or you might, some other, some other place, you might run into this. What would this mean? If I had i, i infinity, what would that, what would that, what would we mean by that? So here's i, right? So it would be, it would be the vertical ray. That would be this thing. OK. So this is a nice notation. We also um, like to talk about slit planes, right? Um, so the, the slit plane, you have C minus, which basically looks like this. Now, it, it, it goes on and on. I'm just drawing it like a Pac-Man so you can kind of it's easier to picture. Actually, this, I mean, I, I really shouldn't draw the circle. I mean, it, it goes on and 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 on. So maybe that's a bad picture, but I just like to make Pac-Mans. I'm sorry. The point is it's, 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 what is it? It's C minus is equal to the complex plane with um, minus infinity to 0 removed. OK, so you delete the negative real axis. There's also um, deleting the positive real axis. This is what we call C plus. Or, although I don't think I have this in the notes, but you could more generally think about something like this, just deleting a ray at angle alpha. And you could call this something like C alpha. But if I was to do that, I would actually, and in the context of that, I would tell you, OK, so that's c minus what? It's um, c minus 0 to, how would you write that ray? If this, is, if this is i infinity, the notation would be something like e to the i alpha infinity. Uh, there's no difference between inclusion and exclusion here. It's not like that. Not yet, anyway. Maybe not ever. Maybe not ever in this course. OK. So these are notations we'd like to use. OK. So guys, what's a function? It's a morphism. <laughs> I have to repeat it for the mic. It's a morphism in, in the category of sets. Has someone been reading Awudi again? <laughs> Good gracious. Not quite the answer I was expecting. Um, I guess it depends on the audience I ask, right? Some folks would tell me, passes the vertical line test, right? Um, if you're fresh from a first test in Calculus 1 from Dr. Sprano, you'd probably be like, it's a single valued assignment of points in the domain to points in the range. I should have known it. Because <laughs> he asked that question every single year. <clears throat> as far as I know. So that's the thing is, but you know, still a lot of um, pre-calculus and certainly the, the classical viewpoint in this was even true of people like Euler and 
you know, great mathematicians is we had this trouble of separating the formula for a function from, from the idea that it was an abstract assignment from one set to another. That's something that's a relatively modern uh, occurrence. I mean, so I, I, I just, I love this quote. I mean, this is Dirichlet in the middle of the 19th century in like a research paper, he felt necessary for him to say this. He said, it is certainly not necessary that the law of dependence of f of x on x be the same throughout the interval. In fact, one, not, one need not even think of the dependence as given by explicit mathematical operations. I, I got this quote from Ramirez's um, complex analysis book. But basically what he's saying is you can ad hoc change the way a function works at, at particular points if you want to. You don't have to be a slave to, well, there's no formula for that. That's not really a function, right? I know a lot of us have that feeling when we're in a, in a college algebra class and a professor does something like, you know, takes a point and takes it off the graph and puts it up here. Like, we well, can't do that. That's just some nonsense that the math teacher made up, right? That's not what the formula says. And um, it's human nature. It took us a while to kind of divorce ourselves from this idea that the function is defined by the formula, right? So, for example, this f of z is equal to z to the n. You know? What's the domain? Well, unless I say otherwise, I suppose the domain is the complex numbers, right? But if you want this to be invertible, what's a reasonable domain? Let's, let's think about what this does. So if you have a little sector like this, right? Um, and if this, you know, this has angle change in theta, it turns out, and here's the z-plane, right? You can think about the function f transferring that over to a larger sector, perhaps. Basically, it blows this up into a larger sector. And the new, the angle here, would be n times the change in theta, right? That's, that's what happens when you, when you work it out. because. Well, I mean, if you don't believe me, it's pretty easy to verify that. What, what a point here would be something like, what, um, some real number rho times e to the i theta 1, right? And this would be maybe rho e to the i theta 2. And what happens when you feed those into f of, f of, f of z? You get rho e to the i theta 1 to the n power, right? But we worked it out. De Moivre's theorem, right? Basically, that's rho to the n, e to the i, n theta 1. And likewise for theta 2, right? So the, the ray, this red ray, red ray, red ray, um, gets moved, mapped over to this thing, right? That's the image of this ray under the f mapping. And the image of the blue ray, oh, hey, hey, sorry. This one goes over to here, right? So this is the, you know, that angle. Um, so. All right. Now, what happens if this n Delta, what happens if this, uh, you know, well, certainly if you take the whole complex plane as the domain for f, it's not going to be one to one, right? Or, or even if, if, if this little pie-shaped wedge is big enough, if, if n is also big enough, you're going to start doubling up again, right? So if you don't want to double tap any points, I mean, if you don't want to hit a point twice, or worse yet, triple or, or more, then you need to somehow cut down the, you know, the domain in order to get injectivity of such a function, right? Let me be more, more precise here. Well, actually, before I be precise, let me give you a definition. <coughs> so, If f is a function from, say, s to the complexes, um, and so 
So this is a function, all right? And u is a subset of s. Then f restricted to u, and we write a vertical bar with u like that, is a function from u to the complexes defined by f restricted to u of z is just equal to f of z um, for all z and u. So to restrict a function is basically just to take its domain and chop it down to a smaller domain. So what I was trying to motivate, perhaps poorly, <laughs> in my previous picture is simply the following, that it may be It may be that f is not injective. All right, it may be that f is not one to one. And if it's not one to one, that means it can't be inverted, right? But if we choose the set u, uh, in the right way, such that the restriction of f to u is one to one, then we can at least invert that map. For a smart choice, it may be that we have the restriction of f to u is one to one, hence invertible. Such a restriction, which is invertible, is known as a local inverse for the function, all right? So for, for example, um, if I was to Uh, look at this <coughs> aperture here. So I'm going from, say, 2 pi um, over n to minus 2 pi over n, right? And I'm in inside here. So you think of this as my u. If we take f of z equals to z to the n, you can show then that this little sector maps to what? Basically, these kind of just balloon out and they almost reach the negative axis. So it Now, if I, if I focus just on a subset, right, I could like, just cut the, you know, maybe this is part of the unit circle, okay? Then this little red pizza pie becomes a whole pizza. Well, modulo one, one line, but that's just a cut, so. No one's like, hey, you cut my pizza, I've got less to eat. So, my kids don't say that, I don't know. So that, um, now of course, for the points which are beyond modulus one, those blow up further under the nth power function, right? So the inverse, now this, of course, what I'm saying is f restricted to this, this u, right? So f restricted to u is invertible. And the inverse to that is known as the, is the principal, principal branch. I think that's a, I don't know, I, I debate whether it's PAL or PLE. Anyway, it's the principal branch. Um, what's the formula for it? So F restricted to u of w is actually the notation in the inverse. It's, this is the notation, the nth root of w, right? Uh, this is the principal nth root. And the way that is defined is you take the ordinary nth root in the sense of real 
like algebra. And then you do um, the exponential of i arg w over n. So the, the principal nth root is defined by the principal argument. This is called the branch cut. The reason it's called the branch cut is, so if you look at w to the 1 over n, right? This is n things, right? There's n things in the nth roots of w. And so what a branch cut does is it selects one of those n things. This corresponds, all right, so where did those n things come from? Those n things came from you know, mapping different parts of the complex plane over to the w plane. So in particular, this, uh, this sector maps to the slit complex plane. All right. And um, the local inverse with respect to this restriction is known as the, the principal branch. If I was to look at another sector, I would get a different branch. And there's actually infinite, there's n things in this, right? But, um, well, eh. there's more than n branches. I mean, you could, that's the thing is I don't have to do the branch like this, right? I could, I could put it pretty much anywhere. Anytime I take some kind of like 2 pi, um, well, I guess it's 2 pi over, I guess it's pi over n because it's two of these, right? So, wait a minute, no. <sighs> Sorry. Oh. Oh. I'm, all of a sudden, I wonder if I'm supposed to have pi over n here. I got two pi over n in my. I have no doubt about the, the formula over here. I have doubt about whether um, this is right. Yeah, this should just be pi over n. This is a mistake. I, 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 I wrote it down wrong in my notes this morning. Hopefully it's not in the notes, but th this should just be pi over n, right? Because if you raise this to the nth power, basically this goes over to pi. If you raise minus pi over n to the nth power, it goes over to like minus pi and it approaches it. And that gives you this, this slit complex plane. But the point is, if you take any, any aperture with you know, uh, angle 2 pi over n, and you feed this to the nth power function, what happens is it, it blows it up, right? And it'll cover the whole, the whole complex plane in the image, the so-called w plane. Right, and <clears throat> but if you were to do this one, you'd end up with the the alpha. Uh, if this if this is um, if this is alpha angle alpha, you end up with the slit alpha plane over there. I have formulas for the alpha th <laughs> the analog of the principal roof root um, based on uh, angle uh, an argument which is based on angle alpha. So arg alpha of z, uh, of, of z, what that would be, would be the element of arg of z such that what? Um, let's see here. I think alpha is less than argument alpha of z is less than or equal to alpha plus 2 pi. I mean, if you think about it, why is the principal argument based on going from minus pi to pi? That's just kind of artificial. It's a choice, right? There are problems where that choice is annoying, and you might want to work with this argument instead. It's basically just saying, hey, you choose a 2 pi length of standard angles to work with. 
So if you want to relate this to the other notation, arg minus pi is equal to the principal arg. Right? And the, the, the principal argument goes from minus pi to pi, where minus pi is not included, but pi is included. That's what we defined before. So in a nutshell, if you want to define the principal and through, it's based on the principal argument. But you could define a, a different branch that's based on a cut at, at the angle alpha instead. So if you use principal argument, we have a, a cut at, at minus pi. Whereas if I use the alpha argument, I have a cut at alpha. Now, <clears throat> so I mean, this is, it's, it's probably easier to see some of these things if you look at you know, the squared function or the cube function or something. If you look at my old handwritten notes, I have drawn pictures um, that look at it. So well, to visualize a complex function, we can't look at a graph, right? Because the domain's already two-dimensional. And if you were to try to graph the domain and range simultaneously, it'd be four-dimensional. It's hard to look at. So instead, what we do is we draw a picture of the domain and a picture of the range, and then we kind of just study how different shapes in the domain map to the range. That's our, our typ typical technique to understand what's going on for a complex function. So essentially, the squared function, what it'll do is it'll take a half of a complex plane, and it squares it to the whole complex plane, right? Um, if you look at the cube function, it takes, if you have 2 pi over 3 sector, it will blow it up into the whole complex plane. And that's, that's pretty much it. So here I just did it for the nth one. But <clears throat> so that brings us to the so-called complex exponential. Now there's, there's more in my notes. I think if you read my notes, it'll make more sense probably than me at the moment. But um, <clears throat> the this, this show must go on here. So. Oh, probably should erase that. I always feel like this room is dark. Do you feel that way? Maybe it's just me. There might be a presence. <laughs> complex, complex exponential. The spirit of Beilu. <laughs> so <laughs> the definition, um, e to the z, all right? And there's a typo in my notes here. I actually, I found a few of them. I'll send you an email about it, my laundry list of errors I found in the notes. Um, most unfortunate, but so. Yeah, where is Landon? I thought he was going to, was he going to take this or wasn't going to take this? I forget what he's going to do. If Landon was here, he would have found him. But um, it's OK. I, I'm missing an I in the notes, which is most unfortunate. Now, here's a more, you know, uh, basically, e to the x plus i y is e to the x times e to the i y, but that's e to the x times cosine of y plus i times the sine of y. All right. Now, so. The complex exponential is a combination of the imaginary exponential that we worked out the other class, right? And so this has all of the goodness of the adding angles formulas built into it. But this is the ordinary exponential, which also has, you know, um, well, properties of an ordinary exponential, right? So there, there are nice properties for this. For example, e to the z times e to the w is, guess what? e to the z plus w, almost. <laughs> it's OK. My mic couldn't pick it up. Your, your, your secret is safe. I won't identify you, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Wonder Woman. I'm sorry, yes. e to the, uh, man, that show is stupid. Anyway, e to the x plus i y, sorry. It's on the me TV. e to the x plus i y, what's the modulus of this? It's the modulus of e to the x times the modulus of e to the iy, right? Using the property product of the modulus is the modulus of the product and what I just wrote up here, right? But what's the modulus of an imaginary exponential? 
It's 1, right? Because those are points on the unit circle. Cosine squared plus sine squared is 1. So this is 1. And how about the real exponential? It's positive, right? So we can even drop the absolute value. In fact, this is just equal to e to the x. The modulus of the complex exponential is e to the x. Right? By the way, so <clears throat> if we look at it then, the modulus of e to the z is equal to e to the x, which is not equal to 0 for all x. right? And that implies that e to the z is not equal to 0 for all z in the complexes. Because the only way we could have modulus be, the only way we get have 0 is if the modulus is 0. If the modulus is never 0, the exponential is never 0. So the fact that the ordinary exponential is non-zero gives us that the complex exponential is non-zero. That's kind of nice. Um, I, have a, I currently claim that the argument of the uh, exponential is equal to the argument of its input. That's just nonsense. Um, the argument of the exponential, well, let's use little arg, arg of e to the z, right, is arg of e to the x, e to the iy. What is the argument? y. y is an example, is a, is a token argument. So basically, you've got y plus 2 pi, um, 2 pi times the integers. Now, so we've got this complex exponential. You know, we're, we're going to want to find an inverse to the exponential, right? Yes is the right answer. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so what's the problem with that? Failure to inject. I mean, if we have e to the z is equal to e to the w. Well, maybe not w is a bad choice. e to the z1 equal e to the z2. What does that say about z1 and z2? Now, remember the polar form of, basically, these are the magnitudes. Magnitudes have to match. And the standard angles don't have to match exactly. But this immediately gives us what? This immediately gives me that x1 is equal to x2, and also that y1 um, is equal to y2 plus 2 pi times the integers. Well, is an element of, I should say. Be careful. I mean, the, the, the arguments don't have to match up, right? Because we have that degeneracy. Let me be more to the point here. E to the, um, e to the z has a 2 pi i, um, 2 pi i, 2 pi i uh, degeneracy. Uh, periodicity is the word, I should say. That is, e to the z is equal to e to the z plus 2 pi i times k for any k in the integers. So if I, if I, if I want to picture this, right? if I want to picture the complex exponential, what happens? For example, the, the principle, um, if I go, say, from, from pi, minus pi for y, right? That gives me this horizontal slit. I mean, it goes on and on and on. If, if I was to, say, um, you know, compare this point to this point to this point and so forth, here I'm, I'm going up and down 2 pi vertically. The, um, the complex exponential is mapping those points to the same, same output. Um, so if I want to make the complex exponential one to one, I have to restrict the domain to like a, a horizontal strip. Otherwise, if I go too far up or down, I'm going to come back to where I started again because of the, the way that the argument works. Um, 
So this will map to, guess what? This guy again. Again, sorry, I'm, I don't really, I shouldn't really draw it as Pac-Man because it goes on and on and on. So if I call this thing u, then if I look at f of z equal to e to the z, so here's f restricted to u, the inverse map to that is known as the principal logarithm or just capital log. What's the definition of the principal logarithm? Log. Log of z is equal to what? It's equal to the natural log of the absolute value z plus i times the argument of z. Now, I'd, I'd rather not just drop that from the sky as if we can't derive it. We can derive that formula. Let me show you how. That's pretty much the last thing I'm going to do today, so do not despair. Your weekend will start eventually. Yeah, I'm just giving you some extra value. So e to the z is equal to w. So to find the inverse function, what do you do? You solve for z. That's what you got to do. So our goal is to solve for z. Now, we're going to use the uh, polar form of w. So we do w e to the i arg of w. That's one choice to present the angle for w, right? And on the other hand, we're going to say e to the z, of course, is e to the x times e to the i y. So that's equal to magnitude of w, uh, modulus of w, e to the i arg of w. But remember what this means, there's two equations that come from the polar form. We can compare magnitudes. And we, well, we don't, you know, we can get a solution from equating the argument. That doesn't give us all solutions. But one solution from this equation is um, e to the x equals to the modulus of w, and y is equal to arg w. Now, that, again, that's not all solutions, but it is a solution. And we're just looking for a solution at the moment. And so this gives me that x is equal to the natural log of the, absolute, uh, the modulus of w. And well, that's y, right? So, <coughs> so the log of w, which would be a better formula to write, I think, is the natural log of the modulus of w plus i times arg w. See, that's, that's z, as in x plus i y, OK? And that's why this formula, it's just from solving the exponential equal to the output for the input. This is just a local inverse for the exponential. It's 2 pi i degenerate, so there's many, many other local inverses. You pick any horizontal band of height 2 pi, you get a local inverse for that. And you can use this argument, this alpha argument thing I told you about to do those other ones. I have the details in the notes. But of course, to be annoying, we also talk about little log. What's little log of z equal to? It's the natural log of the modulus of z plus i arg. Excuse me, arg of z. The one before was arg. Sorry, it's probably bad to communicate things by volume. But little arg, it gives you a little log. That's a set of values. The principal logarithm is a branch cut of that to the slit complex plane in the range, corresponding to the selection of that particular band as the restric restric restricting domain in the, the exponential. There is one other bit of notation I should mention. I forget to introduce this, but this is the complex plane without the origin. Now, I should have said that like two classes ago, but I just keep forgetting to. All right. Uh, I wanted to be a little bit further than I am for your first homework, um, so I'm going to give you an extra day. So the homework will be Wednesday instead of Monday, because I still haven't defined, I still haven't told you guys about this, and I wanted to do a few more examples. And so it's just a little bit behind where I wanted to be, so I'm going to give you an extra day, okay?
Have a good weekend. Thanks, guys.